LinkedIn presents. The main slogan in this book, Reality Plus, is virtual reality is genuine reality. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, are we living in a simulation? Philosopher David Chalmers says there's a decent chance that we are, but he's okay with it. Let's begin with a clip from a classic American movie, The Matrix. The film, if you're one of the 17 people on Earth who hasn't seen it, revolves around a character named Neo, played by Keanu Reeves. He lives an ordinary life until he meets Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne, who lets him in on a secret. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the Matrix. No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy, Neo. I just said it would be the truth. Stop! Let me out! Let me out! I want out! I've always sympathized with Neo in that scene. I think most people do. If someone told you that your life is a lie, that the world you live in is a simulation, that what you perceive is not reality, well, you'd be pretty upset too. But when philosopher David Chalmers first saw the film, he had a totally different reaction. A brain in a vat, he wrote in response to the movie, is not massively diluted, at least if it has always been in a vat. Neo does not have massively false beliefs about the external world. And here's the kicker. Dave says, even if I am in a matrix, my world is perfectly real. In the 20 plus years since The Matrix came out, Dave has continued to stew over the questions it first stirred in him. In his new book, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy, he shares his conclusions. Virtual worlds, he writes, are not illusions or fictions. Virtual reality is genuine reality. This bold statement, which I should say is backed up by rigorous philosophical thinking, has caused quite a stir. But then, that's what David Chalmers does. He made a name for himself back in the mid-1990s for giving a name to one of science's most vexing questions. How do the brain's physical processes produce subjective experiences? Dave dubbed it the hard problem of consciousness, and he's been busy trying to solve it as co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness at NYU. That's his day job. In his spare time, Dave is part of a cadre of philosophers who are pioneering techno-philosophy, daring not only to ask philosophical questions about technology, like, is it possible to live a good life in virtual reality, but also to use technology to reanimate longstanding philosophical debates. If philosophy sounds old-fashioned to you, then you haven't spent time with David Chalmers, because in his hands, the discipline is as modern, lively, and relevant as ever. In the book, Dave posits that within a century, we will have virtual realities that are indistinguishable from the non-virtual world. If we want to retain a sense of meaning and purpose in humanity as we make this transition, if we want these worlds and the one we leave behind to be vibrant and equitable, then we need to start thinking about it now. One last thing. Dave and I ended up speaking for more than an hour and a half. What you're about to hear is an edited version of that conversation. But if you'd like to hear the extended cut, it's available in the Next Big Idea app, which you can download by going to your app store and searching for Next Big Idea. Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spark wherever you enjoy podcasts. Thank you. 
David Chalmers, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thanks, Rufus. It's great to be here. This new book of yours, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy, is a head spinner. I've had a huge amount of fun just in the last few weeks sharing, <laughs> sharing some of your perspectives and claims with friends and acquaintances. And um, I'm just rubbing my hands together over here, thinking about sort of the sequencing. I thought it might make sense to begin with your least outlandish head spinning assertions and gradually work our way to your most absurd ideas. <laughs> or not, sure, not, not absurd. Not? <laughs> not absurd in the sense of I actually think they're all totally compelling as you'll as you'll hear. Um, this way listeners may be able to go the full distance with us. Yeah, great strategy. If it works, I'll, I might have to adopt it myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's start with your theory of the extended mind. Our regular listeners will have some exposure to this because we had Annie Murphy Paul on the show, who, as you know, oh, wrote, great. she wrote a book, as you know, called The Extended Mind. It was based on a paper that you published in 1998 with Andy Clark. Do you want to share the, the extended mind theory? The key idea in the theory of the extended mind is that the tools we use can actually become parts of our mind. The paradigm example, I guess, is a, uh, is a smartphone. Uh, which you might think of as a, you know, a useful assistant to help us get things done, to help us make plans and make decisions. But uh, yeah, back in the 90s, Andy Clark and I argued that these tools can actually become part of the thinking process themselves, roughly as extensions of the brain. Actually, back then, our example wasn't a smartphone. We didn't have smartphones yet in 1995 when we wrote the paper. Our central example was just a notebook, um, somebody who writes something down in a notebook and uses that as a sort of memory. Maybe you store things in your, uh, in your biological memory, but actually we talked about an Alzheimer's patient who needs to go to the Museum of Modern Art, checks his notebook, and it says, okay, the museum is on 53rd Street and sets out to the museum. And we contrasted that with the case of someone who does this all with the biological memory. And we wanted to say, oh, Actually, in this case, you know, the notebook is literally part of your memory. It's playing exactly the same role as a biological memory. Back then, you know, we put forward this thesis. A lot of people thought, come on, this is out there. This is speculative. But interestingly, over the next 10 or 20 years, this thesis has, I think, come to seem to many people to be now totally obvious because of the roles that technology is playing in our lives. We all have a smartphone that does so much of the work of our memory for us. You know, no one bothers to remember a phone number with their brain anymore. It's all in the, uh, the smartphone. It'll do navigation for us with, uh, with mapping software. It'll help do some planning for us with a calendar software. So yeah, this technology is basically becoming an extension of our minds. And I don't know, to me, that just rings true. If someone takes away my, uh, my smartphone, I feel kind of helpless as if I've, yeah. been, uh, I've been mentally disabled. It strikes me there are two ways of looking at this. You can either we can either conclude that our phones are turning us into idiots, or there are better things we can do with our brains than store phone numbers or navigate. Right, that we can empower our brains to do more interesting things by by leaning on these devices. I love this detail that you mentioned that Socrates thought that books were making us stupid. And then there's this lovely irony that we only know this about Socrates because Plato wrote it down. Yeah, you know, they were, they were, the ancient Greeks were very, uh, very dubious about this whole writing thing. You know, there was an oral tradition. You'd tell stories, pass them down from one generation to the next, and people would remember these stories. And this was regarded as a very important skill. And then this thing, writing, came along. You could just record this stuff automatically so that anyone could access it. And yeah, Socrates was, was saying, come on, this is not genuine memory. But of course, what we find is that writing has basically just extended our mind. It's made us so much more capable by building on what other people have written down. Mm -hmm. It's given us enormous memory capacities, and arguably writing is responsible for an awful lot of what's happened in in advanced human civilization. The potential is that uh, extended mind technology could do something very similar. I'd like to think that it could, uh, by encoding so much automatically in our devices, giving us access to so much more information and so much more directly, that leaves more room for us to do the creative part, the conscious part. We're still conscious beings at the uh, the center of all this. And we still ultimately, you know, make decisions 
about what to do, but by offloading so much of the uh, the informational drudge work to technology, I think this has got the potential to just open us up to uh, to new possibilities. It's also got the potential to harm us. If you lose your uh, your smartphone, then you're suddenly a lot less capable. Furthermore, if it turns out that say the the tech companies or the Facebook algorithm are controlling what you see on your uh, on your smartphone, mm-hmm. then there are going to be dangers there as well. So, like every technology, I think it's it's got uh, upsides and and downsides, but I think the potential is enormous. We're on the verge of some pretty extraordinary advances in augmented reality technology. I mean, right now we have Apple's rumored to be releasing augmented reality glasses this fall. And by the way, I think most people know that this would be an experience of navigating the world where you have an overlay of of, of additional data and information. So it's, it's sort of part virtual, part physical. Apple's rumored to have thousands of people working on this. Microsoft has their HoloLens technology. Google has Project Iris forecasting a 2024 Mm -hmm. release. So we're talking about, like, if rumors are to be believed, the next two, three, four, five years, we could see several um, kind of mass market augmented reality systems coming forward. And we all know that the iPhone's only been out for 15 years. We've seen how dramatically that has changed our behavior and experience of the world. And so 15 years from now, we could look back and say, wow, just like we talk about pre-iPhone days, we could talk about pre-augmented reality days. How do you think this technology is likely to, to change our experience? Yeah, I do think it's very likely that augmented reality could end up being the next big computing platform. It's just got so much potential. For a start, it could replace all of our screen-based computing in principle. I mean, right now we do Mm -hmm. all this stuff with screens on our smartphones or our desktop computers. But once you've got a good enough set of augmented reality glasses, it can project screens into the world in front of you whenever you need them, giant screens if necessary, uh, on which you can do all your computing. And then they can just go away when you don't need them. So in principle, Augmented reality could replace all those screens. And then just the abilities it would have in like enabling all kinds of information and interaction. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg was uh, was giving a talk the other day, because I, I guess Meta or Facebook is, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. is also very heavily invested in augmented reality technology, but then was thinking about it in the context of language translation, automatic language translation for all the, uh, all the languages of the world. You go somewhere someone starts speaking in some other uh, in some other language and it gets just immediately translated for you as they uh, as they speak maybe in a visual form so you read it through your glasses or mm-hmm. maybe it's directly spoken to you in uh, in english or whatever your uh, whatever your language is just think how incredibly useful that could be recognizing people likewise maybe uh, you walk into a room and it's going to show you people's names at least if they've enabled that uh, that capacity Dave, this is a fantasy of mine. This, this will really be helpful for me because I, as, as a parent of a few kids, walking into the parent nights and there's so many people and they all have different children and I have to, you know, have a little trouble with that. And, and the idea that my augmented reality glasses will just pop up over their heads, their names, the ages of their children. They came, you know, we went to their birthday party last year. <laughs> you know, that will be a great help. I totally need this as I get older. I'm counting on the technology to develop and extend my mind faster than my biological mind shrinks. And as you say, we can imagine this having both incredibly empowering impacts on our on our daily experience and, and the way that we use our brains and also potentially concerning ones. Like one thing that struck me is, you, I'm sure you've heard of the studies of the brains of London taxi drivers that show that they have larger hippocampi, the part of the brain that navigates spatial intelligence. They're using their internal mapping systems more intensively than the rest of us. So they're actually growing that part of their brain. You know, We've also read about blind people who use part of the visual cortex for other purposes to actually like enhance their ability to hear and smell, right? So if we find that, all of a sudden, you know, name recognition and language processing and whatever is provided for us. There's an argument that we could begin to use parts of our brain that we used to use for really kind of basic rudimentary stuff for new purposes, which would mean that without these glasses, we would truly become helpless. Yeah, there's a n- nice scene in the uh, the science fiction novel Accelerando by Charles Stross, where they basically rely on amazing glasses to do everything for them. Everyone carries around these specs, spectacles uh, that extend their mind. They call it a exocortex, and so much of their lives are carried on 
in their specs. And then at one point, the main character's specs get stolen and he's reduced to a shivering wreck. It's like, oh my God, what's going on there? How, how can I do anything? And until he gets the, the specs back, it's just a total disaster. I mean, I guess this is the case for almost any technology. Once, you know, bikes come along or cars and we can get a, we can get around a whole lot better. But then once we don't have the car, it's like, okay, people yeah. are no longer as good at, you know, walking or running or whatever yeah. as, uh, as they were. So I guess we have, to, we have to count on the technology still being there in the future. Normally, technologies don't go away. Of course, if there was, you know, massive nuclear disaster and the internet went, went down, then we'd all be in, in a whole lot of trouble. Well, I'm, I'm sure there'll always be some people like barefoot runners or, or my father with his flip phone who will be holdouts and will resist. We can count on them and it will become entirely reliant upon them if the system shuts down. Let's move on to virtual worlds, moving to, to sort of further into the future, arguably, and, and to more powerful and immersive technologies. Now, when we think of virtual worlds, I, I think of them as sort of different degrees of immersion, right? I mean, we're, we're seeing the beginning of, of VR headsets that are pretty fully immersive. I can also think of, of video games. When I look at the behavior of my children, I, you know, if I walk by their rooms when they're playing games with their friends and I hear squeals and shrieks and yips and yells, I mean, they are having a lot of fun in a high adrenaline you know, play state, it's not full immersion, right? Because they're just looking at big screens. Do you think of that as, as kind of a, a first step into virtual worlds? Yeah, I think um, they're actually kind of continuous in some ways. I distinguish virtual worlds from virtual reality. And a virtual world, you're already in a virtual world when you play a, a video game yeah. on a desktop. For me, a virtual world just has to be a computer-generated world, which is interactive. So when a kid is uh, playing around in Minecraft or Fortnite or Roblox, then they're, yeah, they're already in a virtual world. Virtual reality adds the extra condition of immersiveness, that you have an immersive, interactive, computer-generated world. And that's where, say, a virt you know, something like a virtual reality headset comes in. You put on one of these headsets and you're immersed in a world all around you, a three-dimensional world with your perspective at the center. So there's virtual worlds in both cases. Once it's immersive, I guess, it just becomes all the more real and all the more continuous with physical reality. But that said, you know, right now there's way more people using, say, video games on a desktop than there are using headsets. So right now, the dominant way to experience virtual worlds is non-immersively, possibly in the future. That could change and uh, we'll all start experiencing these worlds immersively. Well, if my children are any indication, some people are already choosing virtual worlds over reality <laughs> if, they, if they're given the liberty to do so. But yeah, it's, you know, we have an Oculus 2 at home. And not long ago, I was playing p the ping pong game mm -hmm. on, on the new Oculus system, which is, I, I love table tennis and it's remarkably accurate as to the physics of, of playing ping pong. I just played mini golf for the first time yesterday and it was the same. It was, oh, like, really? it was exactly like playing mini golf. The ball bounced around in a totally plausible way. The physics engines are getting pretty good. That's extraordinary. I love, I love mini golf. But, but at the end of this game of ping pong, I just instinctively put the paddle on the, on the surface of the table <laughs> and let it go. And of course yeah. it fell three feet and like, I might've damaged the, <laughs> you know, I hope the, it's okay. the equipment. Yeah. It was fine. But, but, but clearly like it is already, compelling enough as an immersive experience that I'm, I'm actually like, in that moment, I believe the table was there. Yeah. And this is just the beginning. And, and there's a lot that's missing, right? Like this sense of kind of the weight of objects that we interact with and, and a lot of like haptic feedback. There's a whole lot of technology that will be necessary to actually fully cause us to believe that we're inhabiting this world. Is it, is it your view that that it's just a matter of time? How, how long do you think that'll take? I think it's gradually going to get there. I mean, there's plenty of short-term obstacles, not least that, you know, people still get certain amounts of, you know, motion sickness if they stay in the VR too long. I find I'll often stay in there for maybe half an hour or an hour at a time. But, you know, I'll spend 12 hours sit sitting, staring at my desktop computer, doing stuff on the internet. And so far, that's not happening for VR. But, you know, that'll get better with the technology. I think um, the body is the biggest limitation for now. I mean, it's getting pretty good at vision 
and hearing, but actually, you know, touch, you don't get much of a sense of touch, let alone things like eating or drinking or sex. Um, you know, there are not really adequate versions of those things in VR. So I do think that's, that's a long-term problem. But over time, maybe uh, we'll, for example, develop brain-computer interfaces where VR devices start interfacing directly with the brain rather than having to go through the, the sensory organs. And maybe for things like the bodily sensors and touch and so on will be much more realistic that way, it could even be that, you know, eating, um, or maybe it could, uh, it could stimulate the taste areas. So you eat a nutritious but tasteless blob in physical reality, and your brain will be stimulated in such a way that you'll have the best meal you ever had, as far as it tastes like, in, uh, in virtual reality. If I could feed my kids kale and, they, and they'd believe it was a Rice Krispie treat, that, that I think would be progress. People are already doing it now, by the way. You can go to a restaurant and just put on a headset that, get, that makes the food look totally amazing and otherworldly. Huh. So it actually, I mean, it tastes more or less the same, but actually having this new appearance inside the virtual reality headset, uh, for some people it's like, oh my God, that transformed my whole experience of eating this meal. The Anxious Achiever is the podcast about your mental health and your work where leaders from top companies, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, and leading experts share how they've managed through anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, and how they've become better leaders in the process. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel seen, and you'll learn great tools and skills. And I guarantee you're going to look at leadership in a new way. Come find out why we won the Mental Health America 2023 Media Award get The Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy and AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Now we're coming up to some of the kind of bold assertions you make in the book. You say that virtual worlds, which are likely to become more and more compelling and immersive, uh, such that we eventually will choose to spend sustained periods of time there, uh, that virtual worlds are real and that you can live a good life there, uh, maybe even a better life. Yeah. The main slogan in this book, Reality Plus, is virtual reality is genuine reality. So, you know, there's a long tradition of thinking in these virtual worlds, these virtual realities are just kind of second class realities. They're illusions, they're hallucinations, they're fictions. But I think that doesn't really do justice to the status of virtual worlds. I want to say that, you know, when you're in a virtual world, you're interacting with real objects. They may be digital objects to be sure, but they're there. Uh, what happens in virtual reality really happens. Maybe you know, just even take a virtual world like, say, Second Life. It, it peaked around 2007, but it's, uh, it's still going strong. And there are people who build communities in Second Life and build relationships. There are people who work there and you know, sell things there and so on. I think this is now, I mean, maybe video games are to some extent escapism. They involve role-playing fictions. But I think by the time you get to you know, community building in a, uh, in a virtual world, Everything happen happening there is real. It's digital, but it's still real. And what's happening there can have really serious meaning for you. People have built deep and serious relationships in virtual worlds. People have built communities. Uh, they've got projects. I think in, ultimately the virtual world could end up being continuous with the, uh, the physical world in the kind of meaning it has to us. When you say that virtual worlds are real and authentic, 
To what extent is that just a semantic argument or an expansion of the definition of what real means, right? I mean, there are certainly some people who might say, well, they may be real to you, Dave, but they're not real to me. I guess I'd want to say that they're basically on a par in most important ways with the physical world. Um, you look at the physical world, okay, it's made up of a bunch of atoms. They're not particularly intrinsically meaningful in themselves, but they add up to very important things that we can interact with, that we can invest with meaning ourselves as conscious creatures. I think everything that we do of the physical world, we can do in principle with a digital world. Maybe the digital world is ultimately made of bits. Bits are not any more or less meaningful than atoms. But once these bits get arranged into the right kinds of structures, we can likewise invest them with meaning and reality the same way we do with the physical world. So I, I guess I'd want to say the two are continuous. I mean, maybe there's one asymmetry, which is that, you know, the physical world was there first and virtual worlds get constructed within the, uh, the physical world. But I don't think that that makes virtual worlds unreal. I mean, just say God is in heaven and constructs the physical world. The mere fact that it was created doesn't make it, uh, doesn't make it unreal. But well, there's a great line in um, in the movie Free Guy that came out mm -hmm, last mm -hmm. year, which centers on on the experiences of non-player characters in a video game. And one of them says, does that mean none of this is real? And the other one says, look, I'm sitting here. Sitting here with my best friend trying to help him get through a tough time. Right? And even if I'm not real, this moment is. Now, if that's not real, I don't know what is. I don't know what it is. So your reality kind of comes from the, the relationships we're having are real, the communities are real. I say, you know, that means that what's going on in these worlds should be recognized as real. That quote gets to the heart of, of what strikes me as the most critical element for meaningful experiences in, in whatever reality you're in, which is the existence of other people. Mm -hmm. And that's and that that of course is uh we can't be 100% certain of, you might say, as a philosopher, <laughs> right? But I'm very hope we're, we're all very hopeful that other people do genuinely exist and have authentic experiences. But if we are, it, I mean, this, this has been my experience with my children and their, and their video game playing, which is obviously very controversial for parents. People are very concerned about, you know, the time kids spend, you know, playing games. For me, there's a huge distinction between playing games with a half dozen friends and having a, an immersive, interactive social experience with, with laughter and joking and leading and following and strategizing and collective thinking, uh, that that strikes me as a very rich experience. And again, measured in squeals of delight, it's among the most powerfully positive experiences they have. Yeah, so this is actual social virtual reality. I mean, there's probably a role for non-social virtual reality. I mean, we do have plenty of meaningful experiences that are that don't involve other people, whether it's um, you know reading or thinking or walking or whatever. But so much of what gives meaning to our lives is social. It is in interactions with other people, and it turns out virtual reality is actually pretty good at the social. You know, because it's actually other human beings. That, you know, you don't you can use VR by yourself, but a lot of VR has now been set up for people to use together. And obviously, yeah. Video games started off as single player, but they rapidly became multiplayer and these massive multiplayer online worlds became so crucial. And now there are so many, you know, the biggest video game platforms are largely social. Um, so I think what we're finding is that these digital worlds serve as really very good um, locuses for social interaction. Let's make the case, you and I, that, because that, I'm very intrigued by this, assertion that maybe living in virtual worlds will be an even better experience than reality as we experience it now. Now, I, there, there are obviously going to be a lot of people listening who think that's preposterous and who find it haunting. I don't want to say straightforwardly virtual reality is going to be better than physical reality. Okay. What I'd prefer to say is that maybe there are going to be upsides and downsides for both. There are going to be some things that VR can do for you, which are better than what uh, physical reality can do for you in those respects. Maybe you'll be able to fly in virtual reality. Okay, whole new experiences. Maybe you'll be able to sit around in a room with relatives who are on the other side of the world, which yeah, uh, you yes. couldn't do without some kind of digital 
technology. Maybe you'll get to you know experiment with having a new body, experiment with new forms of identity, which would be yeah. much harder to do in physical reality. At the same time, you know, physical reality has some advantages too. You know, um, boy, if you like uh, if you like being in nature, well, yes. physical reality is going to do yeah. that for you better than virtual reality, which is human made by definition. If you appreciate you know the uh, the body, at least in in any in any near term future, you know the pleasures of the flesh in virtual reality are not going to match up to those in the in physical reality. Maybe that could eventually change with enough we're enough you know brain computer interfaces and and so on. But that's very that's very long term. Um, so I guess what I want to say is there there are basically upsides and downsides of both. But in principle, both give you room for the full range of the human condition. It's not saying that VR is going to necessarily be wonderful, but it'll give you the full range from the wonderful to the awful, just as you can get in physical reality. And But if you describe our lives today, living in glass boxes, getting in glass cars, going to glass shopping malls, spending most of our time indoors to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, they might have been horrified and thought, well, that's an impoverished existence, right? And today, when you posit in, in, in your book, that, hey, uh, we are likely to spend an increasing amount of time in virtual virtual worlds. These will be authentic experiences, and they will be largely good experiences. And people have this response, well, that's an impoverished existence. That's that's terrifying. Do you think to some degree this is a familiarity bias that we're, you know, we prefer what, what we're accustomed to, and we just, it's just very hard to think ahead to what the advantages of these future worlds will be, which no doubt will also be offset by some disadvantages. I do think that's a big factor in how we how we think about this. We tend to be pretty conservative about how we want our lives to be. But then you you know if you go back say two hundred years, let alone two thousand years, and say look at this life two thousand years in the future, uh, many people are going to say, oh my god, that's uh, that's dystopian. They're uh, they're, uh, they've lost contact with the uh, the real world, and now they're just living in these uh, these constructed environments. But actually, you know, we know from being here that living in a constructed environment, like say New York City, hey, well, it's not uh, it's it's not so bad. Maybe it's artificial, but it's brought with it new forms of meaning and interaction that enabled new forms of community. So I think it is a little bit hard for us to think ahead in that uh, in that respect. It's also worth saying that again, none of this has to mean abandoning physical reality, at least for the next, say, 100 years or so, virtual reality is just going to be part of one's, uh, part of one's life. So maybe you'll spend uh, you know, some hours a day, maybe half your time in physical reality, half your time in virtual environments, just as you know, we work, we play, we socialize, uh, we're with our families in different environments. So insofar as VR is just part of the equation, then you can, have, you can also satisfy your itch for being in nature and in physical reality while also having the uh, the virtual part. And again, I don't think that the virtual part has to be less meaningful than the non-virtual part. Well, and, and when you talk about dystopian scenarios, there are a couple that come to mind right now. One is that if people start spending a majority of their time in virtual worlds, there's the concern, this, this has been expressed in movies and, and science fiction, that we, we will basically no longer invest in protecting our actual physical world, right, <laughs> and and put put our resources into virtual worlds, uh, which could exacerbate the problems we already have with the environment. The other dystopian scenario is that if these virtual worlds are owned by private companies, mm -hmm. we may be pressing up against questions of of commercialism. And we already deal with commercialism in our environment, right? Billboards and so on. But if if the commercial elements of the environment that we inhabit is present in the very pixels of our vision, that's potentially kind of dystopian. Yeah, there's a lot of potential for dystopia in VR, just as there's, there's lots of potential for utopia. There are amazing ways that you know societies could develop and experiences it could enable, but there are a lot of ways in which it could go wrong. I guess I worry less about the first part, neglecting physical reality. I just think, I mean, boy, it's true we've displayed all kinds of irrationality about maintaining physical reality already, but I don't really think that it's, uh, this has been a product of, oh, look at all these other places that we have to hang out in. It would certainly be totally crazy to invest in virtual reality to the point of massively neglecting physical reality. And I'd hope that at some point we'll have the uh, collective rationality to, you know, 
think about more than one thing at a time, develop virtual reality, but also work hard on protecting and developing physical reality. The corporate side of this is, I think there is a really principled worry there, which, yeah, virtual worlds have to be developed by someone. They're kind of artificial by their nature, and whoever develops them has an enormous amount of power. And at least for now, most virtual worlds are, or at least they're built on platforms which are controlled by by corporations. And yeah, whoever controls a virtual world is in a way like, like the god of such a world. They created it. They're extremely powerful with respect to that world. They're all-knowing in principle. And obviously, once you've got the tech companies in this role as a gods of the virtual world, that just brings so many uh, so many potential dangers. If you think privacy mm-hmm. and manipulation are big issues in social media right now, wait till that applies to the, you know, the whole virtual worlds that we're inhabiting. It's as if corporations didn't just control little local aspects of our lives, but would control the whole environment around us. So I do think there's a lot of dystopian potential there, especially with respect to yeah, manipulation, monetization. Maybe in principle, we could lose our autonomy if we don't have enough control over our environment and over our, our actions. So, I mean, I very much hope there are going to be ways to develop virtual worlds where they're not just controlled by corporations for the purposes of monetization, but maybe there, you know, there's this open metaverse model that could be controlled by users, governed by users, where we could, maybe people could choose the kind of world of the kind of society they want to actually inhabit. So I hope in the long run, there's going to be a very rich diversity of virtual worlds for uh, for people to choose between. But I don't know, you could certainly spin a dystopian scenario where two or three corporations control everything. And it's very hard for any other model to uh, to get a hold. Yeah, well, well, it it arguably increases the importance of coming up with new forms of organizations. People are talking a lot now about decentralized autonomous organizations, mm-hmm. you know, running on the blockchain but uh, building systems that are more user controlled, uh, where, where we collectively, <laughs> collectively control our environments and actually thinking through these future scenarios, I think is a very useful and important process. You talk in the book about different possible virtual worlds. I mean, we'll put, we probably have options of different kind of worlds to visit. And, and you mentioned this scenario where NASA might make available a virtual world where you can, you can fly through space. Uh, or, or, you know, get in spaceships and explore a highly accurate simulation of, of the galaxy. Um, one can imagine like museums or nonprofits building metaverses dedicated to artistic expression or what have you. Yeah, I think the sky is the limit for, uh, for virtual worlds. I mean, we already have so many. We already have a vast range of virtual worlds now. You open up like the Oculus Quest and the, uh, the App Store and it will take you to, uh, yeah, you can already go for a trip through the solar system or through the human brain. But you know, for now, I think for mostly we tend to be basing virtual worlds on the physical world to some extent. But I think as things go along, I think we may start questioning that assumption. Why do our virtual worlds need to resemble the physical world? Maybe we'll have worlds with wholly different laws of laws of nature. I mean, there's already mm-hmm. like anti-gravity worlds we can go into, and there's you're kind of flying around with no gravitational forces. But yeah, maybe we'll actually be able to use virtual worlds to construct wholly new forms of reality. And as you mentioned before, the brain is very plastic. It can, it can cope with many, many different, many, many different things. So I don't know if we construct a five-dimensional world, if the brain will be able to, to handle that. But I think there's the possibility of, you know, exploring really very new and different forms of reality. The Next Big Idea is sponsored by The Next Big Idea Club. That's right. The Next Big Idea is more than just a scintillating podcast with a debonair host. It's part of the coolest learning platform on the planet. Here's how it works. Every season, our curators, Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Cain, and Daniel Pink, handpick dozens of the best new books. Then we partner with the authors of those books to create Book Bites. These are 12-minute audio summaries written and read by the authors themselves. And the only place you can find them is in the Next Big Idea app. And that's not all you'll find once you download it. Our app also has beautiful audio and video e-courses, ad-free versions of this podcast, bonus author conversations, and lots of other mind-expanding content. 
Download the Next Big Idea app today. Better yet, do it right now. Pause this recording, go to your app store, and search for Next Big Idea. Getting smarter has never been so easy. Well, I think we may be ready to take a step further in the direction of outlandish and head spinning, uh, which is to address the simulation hypothesis, the possibility that we may all be living in a simulation right Mm -hmm. now. Can you walk us through that argument? Yeah, I mean, in a way, this kind of grows out of what we've been talking about, you know, oncoming virtual world and virtual reality technology. Right now, virtual reality technology is fairly primitive. So if you put on a VR headset, you know you're in a virtual world. It's a bit cartoonish. It's got There's many giveaway signs of being in a virtual world. But as the technology gets better and better, these virtual worlds are going to get more photorealistic, more convincing, and it'll eventually get to the point where virtual realities are indistinguishable from physical realities, where you could put someone in to a virtual world and they're actually, they may not know whether they're in a virtual world or in a physical world. And once we have that technology, of course, that's just going to immediately raise the question, how do we know that's not happening to us? Could it be that we are right now in a virtual world? Could it be, just to make the case more extreme, could it be that our whole lives we've been in a virtual world? And you know, that's basically the scenario made familiar by movies like The Matrix, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where, uh, yeah, Neo wakes up in the beginning of the movie, apparently in a normal physical world, but then comes to discover that all this is, in fact, a giant computer simulation, a virtual reality, if you like. And you know, that, just, that just raises one of the deepest questions in philosophy. How do we know anything about the nature of the world that we live in? Some people put this by saying, is the world around us real or is it a simulation? I would put it by saying, is the world around us physical or is it virtual? Can we ever know that for mm-hmm. sure? And there's this thing, the simulation hypothesis is, is just the hypothesis that we are in fact living in a computer simulated world right from the start that was set up by a simulator in the next universe up. Just as we can create simulations within our world, maybe someone else created a simulation, which is our world, and that's the world we're living in. The logical argument making the case that there's a high probability that we're living in a simulation, which I think Elon Musk at, at one point famously kind of tossed out, was put forward by Nick Bostrom. And I think you had you had written a paper right around the same time. I understand the hypothesis to be computers are getting more and more powerful. If the pace of the increasing power of computers uh, continues, at some point, whether it's 50 years, 100 years, 200 years from now, it will be possible to um, to spin up universes in, in, in full fidelity running on these systems. And it's hard to imagine that our future progeny would not be curious enough if they have the capacity to spin up worlds in which consciousness emerges, right, mm-hmm. uh, and, and full, full universes. It's, it's hard to imagine that they wouldn't choose to do so. And if they do have this capacity, they're likely to spin up, you know, uh, millions of of these worlds, and 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 if they do so, the probability that we are not living in a simulation, opposed to living in the original world, is only one in a million. Let's say in that in that scenario. Of course, a, a, a contrarian scenario is that the world ceases to exist; that we <laughs> we wipe ourselves out as a species. Uh, we would not be living in a simulation if twenty five years from now there's an apocalyptic event. In the absence of apocalypse, it's more likely that we'd be living in a simulation. I think that you've landed at, I I believe, an estimate that there's a 25% probability that we are, in fact, living in a simulation. Is that right? Do you want to, why would your estimate be 25% probability opposed to 99%? Yeah. So I think Elon Musk was uh, was following an early version of the argument put forward by Hans Moravec, the roboticist and futurist, who said, yeah, basically, it's overwhelmingly likely that we're in a simulation because... Many, many simulations are going to be developed in the, uh, in the history of the universe. Way more simulated beings and unsimulated beings. Therefore, what are the odds I'm one of the unsimulated ones? Maybe, maybe a thousand to one against if there are a thousand times more simulated beings. 
There's a more more sophisticated version developed maybe 10 years later by Nick Bostrom, which he calls the simulation argument, where he, he doesn't argue directly for uh, we're probably in a simulation. Instead, he argues either we're probably in a simulation or simulations won't be created. And then he says, well, if simulations aren't created, that's going to be for one of the reasons you said. Maybe we'll destroy ourselves first, or maybe we'll have the ability to make these simulations, but we'll choose not to, maybe because we think they're too dangerous or they're too unethical, so we won't create them. So Bostrom's argued for a three-way conclusion. Either we're probably in a simulation, or most civilizations will go extinct, or they won't create simulations. So I think he ended up maybe around... 33%. Thirty-three percent. Okay. I end up organizing things just a little bit differently. I think one other way, one other very important way, the argument could go wrong, is if it turns out that you can't have consciousness in a simulation. Many people are, you know, this is a very deep and controversial question whether a digital, a fully digital system could be conscious in the way that biological humans are. And you know, actually, my day job is to think about a is to think about consciousness and its relationship to brains and machines. And personally, I'm in favor of, I'm inclined to find it plausible that there could be a consciousness in a digital system, in a simulation. But if there's not, as many people think, then simulations, then we can rule out the simulation hypothesis because, hey, we know we're, uh, we know we're conscious. Right, right. If a simulation can't be conscious, we can't be in a simulation. So, so the way I end up doing things is roughly breaking it down. How could this argument go wrong? First, it could be impossible to have conscious human-like beings like us in a simulation. Second, it could be possible to do it, but people won't end up creating them. And then I say, okay, as long as both those conditions are satisfied, as long as they're possible and people end up creating them, then most beings will be simulated. And then I say, okay, how probable as each of those claims. How probable is it that conscious human-like simulations of us are even possible? I say at least 50%. Mm -hmm. How probable is it that if they're possible, enough civilizations will create them that most beings are simulations? I say, yeah, at least 50% for that. Put those two together, multiply them out, you get a 25% probability that most beings like us are simulated. And then just, just by the original chain of reasoning, you get, okay, that looks like it's about a 25% chance, at least a 25% chance that we are ourselves in a simulation. So that's how I get to, that's how I get there. You shouldn't take the numbers too seriously, but I do think this is a, you know, this is some reason for taking the possibility seriously. This notion that we may be living in a simulation is, is is kind of horrifying to a lot of people. Somehow less so to kids. I, I, I remember mm. <laughs> I remember sharing this with my 14 year old son. You know this argument in like three sentences that we might be living in a simulation, and he he said, "Oh yes, of course, that makes perfect sense." <laughs> you know because because they, because they spend time in in these very compelling virtual worlds that are that are computer games. And so it, it, it made rational sense to him. But I'm I imagine that you would say to a, a typical listener right now who's thinking, gosh, if we are living in a simulation that's been spun up on the computer of some teenager living in his mother's basement in 200 years, <laughs> you know, this would really just drain all the meaning in, out of my life. My, my guess is that the extension of your argument that virtual worlds are authentic and real and places where we can live meaningful and purposeful lives, that this extends to the, the simulation scenario. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I guess, why is it so horrifying that we're in a uh, simulation? Maybe because you think that if we're in a simulation, none of this is real. But yeah, I think that's the wrong way to, to think about it. If we're in a simulation, and we might be, there's still people, there's still chairs, tables, there's still trees, there's still buildings, there's still communities. That's all digital at some level, but that doesn't make it any less real. Maybe what horrifies some people is the idea of the simulator, this being who created our world and will have massive power over it and might destroy it at any time. But I don't see why that's any different in principle from, say, the hypothesis that there's a God, you know, a God who created our world and has power over it. Yeah, God has the uh, the power to uh, potentially to interfere with our lives and destroy our lives at every at 
any time. But most people who believe in a in a god don't take this as reason to think it's all meaningless or or horrible. Um, so yeah, let's just turn God into a simulator. Why is that suddenly suddenly so much worse? Especially if the simulator is kind of mostly running a hands off simulation. Mm-hmm. They got things started mm-hmm. at the beginning, and now the whole thing is off and running, and the simulator isn't interfering. Then I think that's just a that's an interesting hypothesis about how our world works. It doesn't mean that nothing here is real. It means that underlying all this is some computer processes created by a simulator. But I think none of that is reason to be to be horrified. We can go on with the, you know, what gives our lives meaning is not, I think, how the world was created or how it's run, but things like the relationships that we have, the communities that we're a part of, the experiences that we have. And I think we can get that meaning in principle just as well in a simulated world as in an unsimulated world. Yes, I I I I think that makes sense. I I do think though that the notion our our entire reality may have been a kind of whimsical execution, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, by by again it makes us feel kind uh, of trivial. Somehow. Well, by you know, you know, one, one of potentially thousands or even millions of whimsical sort of worlds generated. Again, I I, I visualize like a teenager in a basement in three hundred years. There's a potential callousness to it that are concerning, but this question: how, how did you feel? How did you feel about us being just on the you know one tiny location in the in an outer arm of the galaxy in a giant cosmos that may have millions of populations? That may make us kind of uh, trivial and insignificant as well. Is the simulation different from that? Well, I I, I would say that this this beautiful process of uh, of discovering our universe and all the possibilities it presents has been a long history of greater and greater humility. No, I think this question of who the simulators would be and what their motivations are is so interesting. One scenario you threw out is that historians may want to analyze other historical scenarios through simulation generation. So, for instance, mm-hmm. what might have happened if Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump? Right. <laughs> right. Well, perhaps perhaps that we're living in the simulation that was generated in order to play out that uh, that experiment. Yeah, let's tweak the parameters and see what happens. Let's uh, throw in a vote on Britain leaving the the uh, European Union. Uh, Maybe uh, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Let's put in the parameters for a pandemic. Let's see what goes in all these different scenarios. And yeah, we, we may just be in the middle of one of those uh, historical simulations for all we know. Well, and, and you say that simulators may be particularly interested in sims who suspect that they are living in a simulation, which means you, David Chalmers, are much more likely to be simulated than my mother, who, who is not at all concerned that we're living in a simulation. <laughs> Any listener listening to this right now, you know, this is a, this is maybe some sign that you're in it. Is it just coincidence you happen to find yourself listening to uh, this podcast about a simulation right now? It's much more likely. Maybe the simulators are really interested in trying to figure out whether humanity will figure out that we're in a simulation. So it's constantly simulating people going through this process. So, yeah, just listening to this podcast has made it more likely that you're in a simulation. And if that worries you, think, think, think about what it means for me, who just spent five years writing a book about it. <laughs> well, then there's the concern that if you find decisive evidence that we are simulated, they might delete you because it, it might make the experiment less interesting, right? If you, you know, I, I like the argument that we need to live really interesting lives to avoid being deleted. The philosopher Hegel said that the point of the universe is to become conscious of its own nature. And once we become, the universe becomes conscious of its own nature, mm. then that's the end of history. So the simulation version of this is like, yeah, the, the simulators set up the universe in order to see when we would actually realize that we're in a simulation. The moment we realize that, at that point, the universe is conscious of its own nature. Um, and at that point, that's the end of history. So maybe at that point, they shut down the simulation or they maybe they upload us from the simulation to the next stage of history. Interesting. Well, I'm hopeful that when, you know, when people hypothesize that if they're trying to save on computer power, they might just sort of, you know, delete less interesting sims that uh, even if they run, even if they run us really slowly, that'd be okay. Like, <laughs> simulators, if you're out there, please upload all of us so we get some 
life after death. You can put us on a slow computer. It's all right. We'll still, <laughs> we'll old, still get to experience it. The, the, old, the, old, the old jalopy in the corner. Well, I, but, but it, it seems more probable that much in the way that like we have so much memory on our phones that we don't bother deleting poor photographs or emails, our simulators might not bother deleting us because there's plenty of there's, there's plenty of storage capacity. Okay. <laughs> that's that's good good backups. That's good backups, <laughs> please. And yeah. reactivate us every now and then, so we're not just sitting there statically in uh, in backup storage, but we actually get to uh, you know have some things happen to us every now and then. You know, when, when we think about motivations for simulators, I mean, presumably a simulator could sort of tap into the on the ground experience of individual sims. The ability to actually inhabit the, uh, a range of people's full experiences could, could could be quite interesting. Like imagine a movie in which you actually are each character in succession. That's 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 in the in the movie. I've I've always loved the Jean Genet quote. I do not take lightly the idea that other people make love without me. Um, <laughs> which is John Jaday had had so much curiosity and appetite that he he, he actually uh, wanted to be pr- a participant in every lovemaking uh, throughout the universe. <laughs> That's quite an who aspiration. Who has a right? Who has a right to be conscious without me being there? That's a, yeah. It's kind of, I don't know if it's a solipsistic thought or a megalomaniac thought. Yeah, my consciousness should yeah. be running the cosmos. It's a bit like being John Malkovich. I guess we all had access to John Malkovich's uh, John Malkovich's consciousness. We could go inside and inhabit his experience. So I guess uh, one yeah one reason for the simulator to build a simulation is to be able to try and access any number of different kinds of uh, of experiences in that John Malkovich way. Maybe we'd also need not just amazing virtual reality technology, but amazing like empathy technology, so we can take someone else's brain or some simulation and get our own brain, our own experience to transform so that it mirrors someone else's experience. But people already talk about virtual reality as an empathy machine. You get to you know, put yourself in the shoes of other people quite regularly, maybe just by putting yourself in a body and an environment like theirs. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but the mm-hmm. extreme version of the empathy machine yeah. is to actually put yourself inside their consciousness. And yeah, that technology may come eventually. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me is that as a philosopher and as somebody who's just curious about these topics as I am, it's easy and fun to go through this kind of thought experiment, I mean, to, to run thought experiments. Like let's, let's run, you know, what if this were true and what if that were true? And that, and that's precisely what one does as a philosopher, right? Over the period of, of many years. But for your average person listening, it, it, you know, this can seem like, I mean, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe amusing and fun for some people, but for others, really disconcerting. <laughs> I, I remember a few years ago, I shared this simulation hypothesis with my brother, who's a biologist working to save the planet. And his immediate response was, how could someone meeting future simulators be so cruel, so cruel as to create all that pain and suffering? I mean, he, his, his immediate reaction was that it was morally objectionable. The counter argument would be that if you believe in biodiversity, which my brother does, which was my counter argument to him, that creating more diverse realities is a moral positive if, if you think that biodiversity is, is good. It's very tempting to get into kind of science fiction mode when you think about these scenarios. So to think about them playfully as thought experiments, which is what I, uh, I guess the mode I often tend to slip into when thinking about this. But then you think, well, what if this is real? And actually, this is the place where, you know, the oncoming technology of virtual reality is saying all this is actually to some extent becoming real. So you, we say we can speculate about the, uh, the ethics of yeah. the simulators in this kind of science fiction mode. Well, I hope they're, they're being ethical, but actually in the future, we're going to be faced with these choices ourselves. I mean, for now, maybe when we make a virtual reality, it doesn't create conscious beings. So the ethics are somewhat more limited, but we already talked about the tech companies creating virtual worlds that many people are in. And we very much hope they're going to think ethically about that. They're going to be strong. There's going to be a need for strong ethics, strong regulations there. And then we get to the future where we might be, where we might be creating simulations that contain artificial intelligences that have the capacity to suffer, to be happy, to experience the range of experiences that we have. So at that point, yeah, the ethics become just terrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we really want to give people or even corporations the power to play God and create whole civilizations? 
just like that? Or should that just be a power that is either restricted to some very few, uh, very limited range of scenarios or actors or maybe banned entirely? Um, yeah, we're going to have a lot of these philosophical discussions at this point. Like, for example, is it okay to create a world with some suffering as long as there's a lot more happiness? Mm -hmm. Or is creating any suffering going to be sort of in itself a bad thing? These are going to be very difficult questions for the uh, for the regulators of the future to to come up against. You know, I I think the weirdness <laughs> the, the weirdness of all these hypotheticals, uh, along with I would argue that, you know the, the the like the disorienting speed of just technological advancement in general that everybody's experiencing, it feels to me like there is arguably a kind of second coming of an existential crisis that perhaps our culture is or will be reckoning with, right? If we think about like existentialism in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, I, I see as, as responding in part to the collapse of a coherent intellectual argument for the existence of God in the face of the expanding explanatory power of science for a whole class of intellectuals there was a perception that th this notion of a benevolent God was no longer sustainable given this increasing explanatory power of science. And it resulted in, in a real kind of collective cultural struggle against uh, you, uh, you know, absurdity and potential pointlessness of our existence. To me, what we're, what we're experiencing today is a whole nother level of that. You know, we had a conversation with Sam Harris about whether or not free will is is something that 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 is is uh, makes sense in light of what we know of science. Um, we talk about possibilities of infinite universes and living in simulations, and I think for a lot of people, and even people that I talk to and know, I get the feeling that this is is actually deeply kind of threatening, and and I think this is when philosophers like yourself come forward with important points of view to hold people's hands and say, let's talk through this. It's going to be okay. Our lives still matter. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, there are different challenges thrown up by technology here that can precipitate this kind of existential crisis. I mean, one is the, uh, one very serious one is the uh, oncoming artificial intelligence. Once we get to uh AI systems, which are at the level of humans or, or maybe even greater, then it's like, boy, are we now becoming insignificant in the universe? Is this the next, uh, the next step of, uh, of evolution? I think that can lead to a serious existential crisis. But there's also the kinds of crises tied to simulation technology and virtual worlds where, yeah, one extreme version of it would be, what if we're in a simulation already? Does that make our lives meaningless? And I think a lot of this does boil down to your philosophical attitude towards these, uh, towards these possibilities. Oh, a third one is the possibility of uploading our brains so we actually become artificial intelligences. Is that something that, uh, that we should do? And I think, yeah, we're going to have to think philosophically about all of, these, all of these cases. Could you survive an uploading process? What is the value of life of artificial intelligence? Is life in a virtual reality a meaningful life? We're going to act actually going to have to figure some of those things out. And I think, yeah, you will find philosophical pessimists here who say this is all a route to, to nihilism. I'm myself more of a philosophical optimist. I think we can find meaning in many different uh, in many different scenarios. So um, maybe it's maybe it's just because I'm a glass half full person rather than a glass half empty person. But I'd like to think that these technological developments needn't empty our lives of meaning. Rather, we'll, they'll turn into new ways to fill our lives with meaning. Well, it's an important message, and, and, uh, and it's a fascinating topic. I, I, I think your book is way ahead of its time, and I think it's possible that people may look back at this, at, at this book in 100 years as having been prescient. That would certainly be a, a happy outcome for me, at least uh, intellectually. I mean, I've certainly been through this thing in the uh, in the past with the ideas initially outlandish, like the extended mind idea coming to seem like second nature and kind of obvious. And I think actually with respect to virtual worlds, this may have been happening for a while. I find that kids are already a lot more open to these ideas than old people like me. You know, they grow up in these, yeah. in these digital yeah. worlds. And for them, it's like, yeah, it's kind of obvious that digital reality is genuine reality. So maybe we're already on a cusp. And yeah, there are certainly many people who 
hear what I'm saying now and they find it totally implausible or even repugnant. But yeah, it wouldn't totally surprise me if in 20 years time, there's a lot more openness to it. And as for in 100 years time, they're going to say, well, come on, this was totally obvious all along. Right, 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 right. Of course, it's also possible that that your book was a was a was a plant by our simulators running an experiment to see how it would impact <laughs> what kind of perception it would get. Yeah, there's probably a whole lot of different simulations running with you know different books focusing in different places, and then now they're doing the market research. I don't know to figure out exactly how to set up the simulations of the future. Indeed. Well, David Chalmers, thank you for taking time out of your philosophizing and hanging out in virtual reality and singing with your band, The Zombie Blues, to be with us today. It was such, a, such an interesting conversation. Thanks, Rufus. This was, a, uh, this was a pleasure. Great to talk to you about these things. Well, Dave, maybe we can, we'll have to play some Oculus mini golf. I've got to check that out. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Sure. Yeah, they got some nice settings by the, uh, by the beach or, uh, or, or wherever. And table tennis. I think I tried the table tennis uh, the table tennis once. That was kind of cool. Super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe our next um, podcast interview will be uh, in a virtual space. We'll, 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 we'll oh, have, sure. Yeah, I love doing this kind of thing. We'll in, have uh, avatars. In, 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 in virtual spaces. I'd be up for that anytime. That was the brilliant David Chalmers speaking with me about his incredible new book, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. That was a head spinner, wasn't it? Right now, you must have a bunch of ideas swirling around in your head. Let's talk about them. Connect with me on LinkedIn, find my post about this episode, and join the conversation. Just search for Rufus Griscom. If you enjoyed this episode, I think you'll also get a kick out of the conversation I had a few seasons ago with Don Hoffman about his book, The Case Against Reality. That episode is called Perception, and you can find it by scrolling back through our old episodes or following the link in the show notes. If you want to listen to this or any other episodes of The Next Big Idea ad-free, then download our app. We are building a virtual world where hundreds of the best nonfiction writers get together and create 12-minute audio summaries of their books. We call these Book Bites, and our app has hundreds of them. So what are you waiting for? You can download the app for free by searching for Next Big Idea in your app store. If you are enjoying this show and have an extra 30 seconds to spare, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a five-star rating and a review if you think we've earned it. It may not seem like much, but it's actually one of the best ways to help get the word out about this podcast. If you're not enjoying the show, write down your thoughts on a piece of paper and throw it in the trash. Just kidding. We're all ears. Send us an email at podcast at nextbigideaclub.com. The show today was written, edited, and produced by Caleb Bissinger. Our executive producer is Michael Kovnat, who has a full head of hair in virtual reality. Sound design by Mike Toda. The team at LinkedIn helps us solve all of our hard problems. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.